Happy Halloween, everyone! For me, Halloween is a time to gather around the fire and tell some good old fashioned ghost stories. I have gathered my 10 favourite ghost stories to share with you tonight. Only the best of the best. You are certainly in for a treat. It's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. Number one, I just want to preface this by saying all of the following actually happened. I've been lucky enough to have a couple of experiences with the paranormal in my life, and this happens to be one of those instances. When I graduated college, I moved back home, into that weird post-grad limbo, where I look for a real job and try and figure out what it is I want to do for the rest of my life. In the meantime, I wanted one last summer of procrastination before I jumped into the real world. So, I asked my friend to hook me up with a job at the local movie theatre. He had worked there for a couple of summers during school as a morning cleaner, running a shift from 4am to 10am every morning. It wasn't a great job, but it paid more than minimum wage, which was pretty hard to come by in a town oversaturated with college kids. I interviewed and got the job where I was highly recommended by my friend. The guy who interviewed me would also be my manager, a scruffy guy named Jeff. He smoked like a chimney and made tank tops and cut off jeans a solid part of wardrobe. He also looked like he hadn't had a good night's sleep in years. But that could also have been all the hard drinking he did every night. I remember he asked me the typical questions. If I was okay with working weird hours, cleaning up vomit, etc. I had worked in fast food as a teenager, so none of that stuff had bothered me. What struck me as odd was the last question he asked. Do you scare easy? I kind of laughed and said no. He shrugged and said, Well, some new highs kind of get spooked by the big building at night. But you know how it is. Big buildings make weird noises. It made sense to me. I have a very active imagination. But I had a hard time being scared in a movie theatre of all places. I was to start my new job the very next day. For the first few weeks, everything was pretty normal. The job was actually pretty easy, all things considered. Throw this away, mop that, scrub this, wipe that, take the garbage out. You're probably by yourself for a majority of the shift. So we were allowed to bring our iPods with us. The theatre was fairly large. Its layout was shaped like a T with the lobby and bathrooms in the stem, the smaller theatres on the left, and the larger IMAX screens on the right. Running above the theatre hallway was the projection area, an equally long hallway with a couple of small offices and all the projector equipment. If you were the first to arrive in the morning, you had to go up a winding staircase to turn on the lights in all the theatres. It wasn't a big deal, Except with all the lights off, the building can be, as Jeff once described it, a little creepy. The projector area was always full of promotional materials, including a sea of cardboard cutouts from all the movies that have played in the theatre. Sometimes the theatre manager would have giveaways and the staff would be able to take some of the things home. It was pretty cool, but when the lights were off, it looked like a sea of people in the hallway. Another part of our job was to meet with the day crew after our shift at 10am and to go over any maintenance problems that we were dealing with and they could highlight anything we needed to address on our next shift. The second thing to strike me as odd was the day manager, Bob, pulling me aside after a shift. You're the new guy, right? He asked. I said yeah and then he put a pair of keys into my hands. Can you make sure this place is locked up at night? 
I know you guys are usually up in the back or upstairs. I don't want anyone sneaking in whilst you're occupied. I asked him if it were a problem, and he looked at me a little flustered, and went on to explain that customers, primarily women, were complaining about a lanky, tall man in a suit that had been following them from theatre to theatre, sometimes into the bathroom. The last several months, several frightened women had come to the front desk, describing a seven-foot-tall man in a black suit, complete with a bowler cap, walking slowly after them. A few times even the police were called. The teenagers that worked the day shift referred to him as the tall man. While he primarily targeted women, occasionally a male co-worker would catch a glimpse of him sneaking into a theatre. On a couple of occasions they would pursue, thinking it was someone trying to sneak into a movie, only to find nobody there. Sometimes there wasn't even a movie playing. We had 12 theatre rooms in total, but Theatre 5 was the worst. Nobody wanted to clean it out. When I first started, I was fairly naive about what was going on, and I didn't understand why Jeff was apprehensive about Theatre 5, and kept assigning me to clean it out. What made Theatre 5 unique was that it sat behind the bathrooms in the lobby. So, to get to the sitting area, you had to walk down a long hallway before reaching the screening room. Being that far back, you were the most secluded, especially when it's 4am, and the only other people that you are with are on the far other side of the building. People cleaning there would complain of nosebleeds, constant headaches, and a feeling of being watched. My first supernatural experience took place here. Theatre 5 always gave me an uneasy feeling, like I was being watched. On multiple occasions, I would take out my earbuds and shout, Hello? into the empty theatre. Of course, there would be no response, and I would shake it off and just go back to my routine. One day, I was sweeping out garbage from under the seats when I heard footsteps. Someone running. I look down at the front of the theatre, and I catch a glimpse of a little blonde-haired boy turning the corner into the long hallway. Immediately, I threw down my broom and chased after him. I ran down the hallway and out into the lobby, where this kid had disappeared. I walked further into the lobby, and saw my boss outside the front entrance on a smoke break. Who's the kid? I asked, and Jeff looked at me. For a moment he was confused, but then he laughed. I'll never forget how casually he said it. So you met Charlie? Charlie was another entity customers often complained about. On several occasions, they claimed a little blonde-haired boy was running up and down the aisles in the theatre, causing all kinds of noise and ruckus during the movie. Of course, it was in Theatre 5. When an usher would come to apprehend the child, he would be gone. The female staff affectionately named him Charlie, after his resemblance to the character in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Charlie was also responsible for knocking over several cans of garbage, throwing papers out, misplacing things, and making our janitorial duties a pain in the arse. Charlie wasn't frightening, just more of a nuisance than anything. We used to theorise that he was the son of the tall man, but the two were never seen together. It took that experience for Jeff to admit that some people have seen and heard some things which was his way of saying that the theatre was haunted. I found it odd, considering the theatre was relatively new. It was built in the 90s on some wetland, and according to some people that had lived in the area, the property was owned by a family who sold it off back in the 1980s. There was no evidence of foul play, and it was not an Indian burial ground. It was just a weird place where strange things happened. I didn't even realise there was a basement until my third or fourth week. The basement, 
as I was told, was primarily used for storage. I'd give a better description, but that's as much as I know considering the one time I was asked to go down into the basement. I didn't even know where the hell it was. It was a Thursday, and I was ready to get out of there. I remember that I had the next couple of days off, and I was ready to relax a little bit when I got home. I still had plenty of time on my shift, but this particular morning, I wasn't really dragging my ass. Jeff gave me a couple of bags and told me to drop them off in the basement. I told him that I didn't know where it was and he pointed down the hall. The last door on the left marked employees only, he replied. I started walking away and he stopped me. Don't go down there by yourself. He added that with a bit of hesitation. There's a lot of shit down there and I don't want you tripping over anything. There were usually only three of us working the shift. This morning it was Jeff, myself and a co-worker named Trevor. Trevor was on the other side of the building cleaning out the theatre. I could hear his leaf blower running. Yeah, we use leaf blowers to blow the popcorn out of the theatre. I didn't want to bother walking across the building to grab him. I figured, I'm an adult. I can drop a few bags into a room. For Christ's sake. Jeff walks out the lobby to have a smoke, and Trevor is down on the other end of the building. I'm by myself, at the far end of a dark hallway. I open the door, and I'm looking at the long staircase that drops into the darkness. I flip the light switch onto my left, and there's a light at the bottom of the staircase. It's flickering. Of course it's flickering. Nobody ever went down there to fix it. I heard a door open from the lobby. Jeff hadn't returned. I'm just hearing things. I look back down the staircase, and I'm about to descend when I hear a voice from the bottom step. Hey. It's a low, raspy voice. And I pause. Hey. Come here. It says again. There's a shadow bleeding in from the bottom of the staircase. I can't tell what it is, but it is definitely a person. Hello, I call down. I don't know why I did. I know that I'm the only person on this side of the building. I know that there isn't just some person hiding in a dark basement. And at this point, my heart is pounding and I'm starting to sweat because I know it isn't normal, and I'm experiencing something that shouldn't be happening. You've got to see this. Come here and look. It says again. The voice is a little louder. It sounds scratchy, like someone with a cold. The shadow is bleeding further into the bottom of the steps. Whatever's down there is coming closer. I toss the bags down to the bottom. Turn off the light and walk down to the lobby. Jeff is walking back inside, reeking of cigarettes. I tell him about what happened. He has a look on his face that tells me this isn't the first time something like this had happened. He almost looked irritated when I tell him I was going to go in by myself. Nothing here's gonna hurt you, he finally said. I think I was taken aback more by Jeff's reaction than the actual incident. Later on, I told Trevor about what happened. We went back to the steps to investigate, and I turned on the flickering light. The bags I had thrown were gone. Theatre 5 had its instances, and the basement was particularly scary, but nothing was quite as bad as my experiences with the projector area. Around 6am, we would take a 30 minute break. Jeff and Trevor would usually go to McDonald's to eat, but it was always too early for me, so I'd lay in the hall and listen to my iPod, no matter how loud I turned my music. I could never cancel out the sound of the footsteps from the projector area. It sounded like a 300 pound linebacker sprinting back and forth, heavy, loud, thumps, up and down the hall above me. I told Jeff about it once, and he remarked that it was just the building settling, and there was a lot of equipment upstairs making all sorts of noise. Jeff 
wasn't the smartest guy, but that didn't stop him from insulting anyone else's intelligence. Maybe he was just trying to keep me from quitting. The turnover rate was pretty insane at the theatre for cleaning staff, and the creepiness was a big factor. The prey was pretty garbage too, but that's a whole other story. So, it wasn't long before I started feeling apprehensive about going upstairs to check the projectors, and turn on the lights in the theatres below. On one particular occasion, I was walking up the steps to the hallway, and I heard what sounded like a child call my name from the bottom of the steps. I knew it was Charlie, because, well, how many children are in the theatre at 4am? This was the first instance of hearing my name. For a week straight, I'd hear voices echoing down the hall from the projector room, Theatre 5, or down the hall. That was easy to ignore once I put my iPod on, but it never shook the feeling of being watched. I had never seen the tall man in person, I only ever had instances where I encountered Charlie, heard noises, or saw shadows. My only experience with it was at the start of my shift, when I was the first to arrive at work. If you're first, it's your job to go upstairs and turn on the theatre lights in the projector hall. I wasn't happy about it, but it looked like it was going to be another morning where Jeff and Trevor were late, and I didn't want to mess around with my shift by waiting around. Since the projector area is dark, typically we'd carry a flashlight with us, going around flipping switches. That morning, I couldn't find the flashlight, which we'd later find in the garbage. Thanks, Charlie. So I walked through the dark hallway of projectors, flipping all the switches. I had stayed up all night prior, watching the Andy Griffith show, which I remember because I was whistling the theme song to myself as I walked down the corridor. Once again, I got the feeling of being watched, and something several yards away, in the area with the projectors, overlooking the IMAX theatre rooms was staring back at me. I stopped whistling, and tried to focus my eyes. It was a cardboard cutout. They were everywhere, so I dismissed it and was about to flip the next switch, when the cutout moved. I froze. What I thought was a cutout was actually a figure hunched over. It was quietly whistling the Andy Griffiths theme song, imitating me, only whistling slowly. Slowly, it rose up from its crouch, revealing itself to be at least seven feet tall. It was a man. All I could see was a silhouette against the red exit sign light above, and some of the projector computer monitors. It started towards me, whistling quietly. I wanted to move, but for some reason my feet were cemented in the spot, and I had cotton for a tongue. I didn't know what to do, Slowly the tall man stepped towards me. He walked with a bit of a waddle, as if he had a limp on his left leg. I couldn't exactly tell. He had taken about three or four steps towards me, when something caught his attention, and he turned and walked into an office down the hall. I turned back and ran down the steps, and I waited outside the theatre until the boss and the rest of my crew arrived. I told them what happened, and they explained that the tall man existed, but that he wasn't going to hurt me. I didn't care. I put in my two weeks, and haven't looked back. Number 2 Years ago, I used to work at a church as the head sound engineer. The bulk of the job required me to be active during the days for summer services. Occasionally, there would be tasks that would be done whenever I got the chance. One of these tasks would be duplicating CDs of sermons for people who would like a copy to listen at home or in the car. 
I would get requests for various sermons, sometimes series spanning months, and I would have to make extra time to take care of these duplication requests in the middle of the night. It never bothered me, and I had a key to getting into the church whenever I needed to. One particular night, I headed into the church sometime around one or two in the morning. Since I know the building like the back of my hand, I rarely turn the lights on inside the building. The ambient light from the street lights would illuminate through the windows, just enough so that I could see where I was going. But beyond that, the building was pitch black. Now the way the church was laid out, there was a foyer which then had doors in the church sanctuary, where the services were held. The sanctuary had a balcony, and on this balcony was the sound booth, where the CD duplicator was located. There is only one door to the balcony, which would be locked from the inside, which was always located in the foyer, with the stairs leading up to it. The balcony is completely open, not separated by glass or anything, and provides a completely unobstructed view of the sanctuary below. The pews, the stage, all of it. Acoustically, the room is very good. If someone was on the stage talking, you would easily hear it from the back of the church and balcony. And if for some reason you couldn't see what you were listening to, you could easily make out which part of the room the sound was coming from. This comes into play later. When I reached the top of the stairs to the balcony in the sound booth, I turned on a light so that I could begin working. It's just a single bulb about 15 feet above my head, and I had no need to turn on anything more than that. This was the only light in the entire sanctuary. I know that might seem crazy to some, but this was a building that I had spent hundreds of hours in by myself at night. I felt completely comfortable at the time. I began duplicating CDs, lost in my thoughts at the peaceful silence of the enormous room. After around an hour of silence, a sound abruptly rang out that startled me about 20 to 30 feet ahead and below of me, in the middle of the pews on the left hand side. I heard a distinctive clink clink sound. It was subtle but clear and absolutely unmistakable to me. Over and over, I knew exactly what the sound was. Allow me to explain. In another part of the church we had a coffee house, of sorts, where people would load up on coffee and donuts every Sunday morning. The coffee was always dispensed in ceramic coffee mugs. Literally, the most basic common mug you can imagine. Your kitchen cupboards are likely most full of them. Anyway, due to the high volume of these mugs that circulated through the church, there were always baristas from the coffee house picking them up from around the church to be washed. Oftentimes they would be missed, and they would lay hidden around the church as multiple mugs were usually connected in one hand. By the handle, mugs themselves would hit and make that distinctive ceramic clink sound. It became regular background noise before, during and after services. After about 10 years of working at this church, it's a sound I knew and recognised very well. But I would be lying if I said I ever consciously thought about that particular sound. So, I find myself trying to process why I'm hearing coffee mugs clinking in the middle of the night, in the middle of our church sanctuary, in the pitch dark. I stood there, peering from the balcony into the darkness below, trying to make sense of it for several minutes, before curiosity got the better of me. I had to figure out what was making the sound. I descended the stairs and into the foyer where the light switches were, and flipped them all on. I immediately felt better, and entered the sanctuary on the ground level. I had pinpointed where the ceramic sound was coming from, when I was on the balcony, 
but unfortunately, now that I was at the source, with the lights on, there was nothing to be heard. It was midweek, and the sanctuary had not been cleaned from the previous Sunday, so I knew that there were probably a few coffee mugs still inside. People frequently left them on top of pews, underneath them, and everywhere in between. I walked down each row of pews, carefully scanning for mugs. Nothing. Knowing there would be likely some on the floor, I go down on my hands and knees in the very front of the sanctuary to take a peek. From this perspective, I could see underneath every pew on each retrospective side at once. Sure enough, there were a few mugs scattered throughout the floor, underneath certain pews. I got up and moved to those specific pews and examined where the mug was. In hindsight, I probably should have picked them up. I didn't, because technically it wasn't my job. I did take note of the most important fact at the time. There were no coffee mugs in close proximity to each other. The closest was three or four feet from another mug, not even remotely close enough to clink together. Whilst I couldn't explain the sound I heard, there was no logical way those mugs could have made those clinks. I had no answers, but I was satisfied enough to just brush it off. I left the sanctuary, turned off the lights at the light switch in the foyer, and returned back up the stairs to the balcony, illuminated by just a single light bulb above me, and consoled by the silence I found myself in once again. I resumed my tasks, and about 15 minutes of productivity had passed, when it happened again. Clink, clink in the same place as before. Clink. My heart stopped, and the hairs on my neck stood up again. Clink, clink, clink. Okay, I had verified this myself. There were no mugs in enough proximity that they could somehow, for the sake of argument, be clinking on their own. They were not clinking on their own. I rushed down the stairs into the foyer and flipped on the lights again. Entering the sanctuary, I dropped to my knees, and once again peered underneath the pews. Nothing. I knew this sound. It was unmistakable. I pinpointed where it was coming from, but there was nothing. No sound. Nothing in disarray. No mugs that could have been in contact with any other. Spooked but frustrated at the same time, I returned to the foyer, instead of turning off all the lights. I left one on in the sanctuary. This made two lights now, one in the balcony and one in the sanctuary. The addition of this light helped set me a little more at ease as I walked through the balcony door to the bottom of the stairs. I locked it from the inside. I don't know what was going on. And maybe I was being a little paranoid at this point, but I wasn't going to take any chances. I went up the stairs once again to attempt to finish my task on the balcony. About half an hour of silence had elapsed, just enough for me to settle the idea of nothing weird happening for the rest of the night. Then it happened again. Clink, clink. Might as well have been a gunshot. I stood up and scanned from atop the balcony. There was twice as much light in there now, and enough to illuminate the room, even if it was still dim. But there was nothing. Nobody was playing a prank. There were no ghouls, spectres, or shadow people dancing around. No big, aha, revelation. Clink. It continued. And so did I. I wanted to go home, so I ignored it. The sooner I finished duplicating these stupid CDs, the sooner I could get out of this damn church and get some sleep. Clink, clink, clink. Again, and again. Maybe about 15 minutes, maybe about another half hour or so, I lost track of time. All that I know is that eventually, it stopped. The silence returned. At one point, I resolved that all of it was ridiculous. There had to be a rational explanation, and as such, it was stupid to hold up on my locked balcony. I went downstairs to get a drink, and on my way back, I flipped off the remaining light in the sanctuary. No need to waste electricity. I reasoned... I'm not going to let some stupid sound dictate fear all night. I returned to the balcony, 
and left the door unlocked, illuminated once more by my single light bulb. I popped in a few more CDs, and then it happened. I don't even know how to effectively describe it, at least in a way that captures the immediacy and sheer terror of it. All at once, the entire room began to shake violently, with a deep, bassy rumble. There are no earthquakes in this part of the country, so that was immediately ruled out. Time seemed to stop as I scanned around trying to figure out what was going on. I looked at the soundboard. You know those LEDs they have going from green to yellow to red? The thing was maxed out red, indicating it was being overloaded by some sort of input. But there were no mics plugged in, no amps turned on and no sound coming out of the speakers. I don't even think the speakers were plugged in, and if they were, they were muted. At the time, I had done professional audio for over five years, and this wasn't something technical. The entire sanctuary rumbled and shook, and after about 30 seconds, it stopped. There was complete silence. I was completely shaken, and I bolted out of the church and went home. I don't have any explanation for what happened, since there were no ghostly things to show themselves or anything super paranormal. I have tried to explain it with logic, but alas. Number three. For what it's worth, I stayed the night with a friend during high school. Me, him and another dude were drinking some beers in this house and the house was getting ready to be demolished. The only items left in the house were OJ's whole bedroom. He grew up in the house and hated to leave and wanted to make it to the last second. So we're all here drinking and bullshitting in his room. The TV was on, but we weren't paying it much attention. Anywho, we all decided to go to the living room and put a couple of sledgehammers through the walls for shits and giggles. We all walked out of the room, and the TV immediately turned off. I noticed it immediately and it spooked me, so I asked OJ about it. And he, without missing a beat, goes, Oh yeah, that's just George. I look at him deadpan as hell. He didn't even try to explain. I asked him who in the ever-loving hell was George, Naturally, George is the man who built the original house and was driving his kids in his dump truck and had the back end raised in such a fashion that they could stand really high in it. Well, long story short, they got decapitated on a railroad overpass, not but 200 yards from the house down the country road. So George hung himself in the attic. And not only did he hang himself, but the attic is only about five feet in height. So that dude put a rope around his neck and lifted his feet high enough, yada, yada, yada. You get the point. So he went on about the other shit that George and the kids would do around the house. Stuff out of place. Doors and windows opening, closing. The usual weird ghostly shit, right? Well, I didn't believe a lick of this paranormal bullshit, even when the TV going off in front of me. But old OJ looked at his clock, and it was around 3.45 in the morning. He looked at me and said, At 4.04 exactly, you'll start to hear intermittent tapping noises always in twos. Tap tap. Pause. Five seconds. Tap tap. Yeah, whatever OJ. Anyway, when the clocks hit 4.04, tap tap. Tap tap. Me and OJ and Nate were all in the same room. I could see their hands and feet, anything that could be used to make this tapping noises, and it very clearly wasn't them. I turned white. I mean, I was turning whiter than a ghost, when I realised that it just might actually exist. And OJ just looks at me, very nonchalantly, and goes, Hold ya. The most bizarre thing about it, though, you couldn't pinpoint the noise. It was everywhere and nowhere at the same time. The sound wasn't directional, it was like it was off in the distance, but you couldn't move closer or further away from it. It was just there, 
Tap, tap. Tap, tap. Needless to say, I refused putting a hole in any of those walls with a sledgehammer. I also did not sleep, and I also got very, very, very drunk after that happened. Still don't know what to think, to be honest, but that's some serious shit, I tell you. I'd just like to add, I went into the attic where George hung himself. I like to think myself as a very stable person when it comes to dark, cold, confined spaces. I don't get phobias, or nervous, really. But to this day, I have never experienced such a dark, cold feeling down to my bones. You could feel the energy in the room. It felt as though it was sucking the life out of you. It took me ten seconds before I came sprinting down the stairs in sheer terror, and decided not to go back up there for the rest of the night. Here's something else that happened. My friend Lighty and I would go to his parents' farm property all the time with a gator, and just explore the 140 acre property pretty regularly a few summers back. As we would come and go, we'd chat with the few farmers that sharecropped the land that was about four or five, and we'd bullshit with stories and whatnot. Now these guys certainly have a sense of humour, but weren't joking one bit when they were telling us about the old lady. So Lighty's grandparents had purchased the land from the bank after an older lady had passed away whilst living in the tiny 1920s depression-style shack on the property. One room, four windows, and it was falling apart. Scary as shit. The typical old farmhouse, right? Well, we noticed a trend in the farmer's stories, or at least one in particular. They all spoke of seeing a woman, an old woman, staring at them through the windows at times. Now, I live my life as the devil's advocate. Each farmer I ask the same question to. Which window? My thought is that they're all bullshitting. They're named separate windows, right? Makes sense. Nope. Each had the same response. All of them. I was baffled. I should note that all of these farmers also don't know each other. All from different local neighbouring towns. But still, we're not in contact with each other. No corroboration, no slick, clever, let's try and scare the shit out of these kids type of scenario. No possibility of it being a lamp in the damn window. Can't be that easy. Still never stopped us from going out onto the damn property. I guess Sue never minded either. That's what we named her, Sue, the window ghost. When Lighty and I were driving on that same property... Two blue orbs rose out from a water tank in a small creek, and just floated down the creek. It was about the size of a baseball. Apparently, Lighty's grandfather told stories of the same two blue orbs, as well as multiple people in that county. It was like some urban legend we'd not heard of until we were told by Lighty's father who eventually filled us in. It apparently happens all over the place, but only in this county and in this creek. So bizarre. I lost my mind watching those orbs float into the air, travelling at the same speed as the water. I'll never forget it, and we never said another word during the incident. Number 4 I figured I'd share with you some strange, and what I believe to be paranormal experiences happening at my place of employment. I work at an old restaurant in a city in Oregon, I will not say which restaurant, for obvious reasons. I work as the bread baker during the night hours. My shift is usually from 8.30pm till around 3am, depending on which products need to be made. My co-workers tend to leave at 10 o'clock. Sometimes the dishwasher is there a little later, though I got lucky moving here and landing this job right away at $13 an hour. But now, I don't feel so lucky. My first experience was the second month of working here. I had just put some hamburger buns in the proofer, and had some time to kill. So I walked into the dining area, and made myself some espresso. Halfway there, I noticed a faint whistling coming from the dining area. I shrugged it off, as it stopped once I entered. As soon as the espresso was done, 
the whistling started again, but louder. I couldn't make out if it was a song or not. But it went on for about a minute and then stopped. My whole body shivered, as I was definitely creeped out. The next day I mentioned this to the dishwasher, and she looked at me for a minute and then sighed. She told me the building was most definitely haunted, and that she constantly hears the whistling as well, but only when she's by herself. Sadly, the conversation ended there, as she doesn't speak English all that well. Fast forward a few weeks later, this experience freaked me out quite badly for a few days. I still get chills thinking about it. You may not think it's creepy, but it was. They have a huge walk-in cooler, filled with tons of prepped food, and so on. This was about 11pm, and the dishwasher was still there. I walked into the cooler to grab some butter. The door is huge and heavy, and there is no way wind could shut the door. Especially because there was no wind to shut it. As I was reaching for the butter, I hear the door slam behind me. I was obviously startled, and thought maybe the dishwasher closed it, thinking I left it open by accident. I walked to the door and started yelling for her, hoping she would hear me, and after about three minutes, no response. I panicked, it was super cold in there, and I kept banging on the door and yelling. And about ten minutes later, she finally heard me and opened it, looking confused. Shivering, I asked her if she closed the door on me, and she said no. I told her that the door closed on me, and the look on her face freaked me out. I texted my boss and told him what happened, and asked him to check the security cameras. When he answered, he told me he watched, and said that he saw me walk in, and about 10 seconds later, the door slammed shut. No one was behind it, it just shut by itself. That never happened to anyone else. We were both confused, and I was weary. A few weeks after, in the dining room, they mopped the floors after every night. I noticed that they were in their usual spot on the tables, and I didn't think much of it. As I was making bread dough at about 12am, something happened that I can't explain. In a span of almost 5-10 to 10 seconds, I heard the loudest crash coming from the dining area that shook the whole building, and the lights went out quickly and came back on. My heart was beating so fast and I felt nauseous. I had no idea what happened. I ran into the dining room and my heart sank from fear. All of the chairs were on the floor, scattered and a few definitely broken. And then the whistling began. I immediately called my boss and he rushed over. We went to the office and watched the security cameras. The video showed the chairs on the top of the tables, and then the lights went out. They came back on, and the chairs were scattered all over the floor. The look on his face filled my body with dread. He promised to stay with me for the rest of the night, and I told him I was becoming scared of working by myself. He said I would be fine. This happened a few days ago, and it took everything in me not to quit this job. This was probably the scariest thing I've ever experienced. It was around 2.30am. The baguettes were in the oven, and it was almost time for me to leave. I had to use the restroom, so I walked into the dining room to get to the restroom. I heard the whistling, but very faint. It was becoming normal, and since nothing had happened for a while, I wasn't creeped out. I got to the restroom, locked the door, and sat down to do my business. About ten seconds in, I hear a faint whisper come from outside the door. I chalked it up to just hearing things, and then I heard someone knock very lightly. My heart stopped. I was alone, or so I thought. I sat there in silence. Another light knock. I very quietly finished my business and pulled myself together. I stood somewhat closer to the door to try and hear what was outside the door. Another knock. 
and then I heard a faint whisper say, Hello? I almost screamed and almost pissed my pants. Even though I had already peed, I kept quiet, in fear. Maybe this wasn't a ghost, but a junkie or creeper who managed to slip inside somehow. It knocked again. Louder this time. The voice whispered, I know you're in there. It sounded like a man's voice, but I couldn't tell. And it began to jiggle the door handle. And that is when I flipped out. I screamed, Leave me alone! The handle jiggled more violently and then stopped abruptly. I stood there in fear. After about a minute, it slammed the door so hard I was surprised it didn't fling open. My heart was racing, and tears were streaming down my cheeks. Everything went silent for a good twenty seconds, and there was another loud bang that shook the whole restaurant. The door swung open so violently, and there was no one there. I ran out of there so fast, screaming and crying. The chairs were flung about, tables overturned, coffee cups shattered on the ground. I ran into the kitchen and grabbed my things, shut the ovens off, hell I didn't care if the baguettes were done or not, and ran out of the building and into my car. I called my boss, sobbing and hyperventilating, and he told me to wait in my car. He arrived about five minutes after, his car flying into the parking lot. I got out, but told him I would not be going back in there. He went inside and came out about ten minutes after looking wary and upset. He told me he watched the security footage and couldn't believe what he saw. As soon as I'd closed the bathroom door, he saw a sort of dark cloud-like figure float in front of the door. Right before the bang, the camera went to static for a few seconds to show the whole dining room a mess. Then the camera showed me running out of the bathroom. It's only been a few days since that happened, and I'm still shaken by it. My boss gave me the week off, paid. I still need to think it through, though. Is it actually worth working in constant fear? Number 5 In the early 90s, I worked as a sous chef at the Hotel Colorado in Glenwood Springs. The employees went to great lengths to tell me all the juicy ghost stories associated with the place. Forbidden rooms, labyrinth basements, hauntings, etc. I never really paid it any mind. But towards the end of my tenure there, two very specific incidences led me to seek employment elsewhere. The kitchen in this place was built in the late 18th century, so think big, very tall ceilings, and damn near ancient fittings and equipment. The first incident happened late at night, on what we used to call the bar line. It was a small kitchen off the main kitchen gallery. They had a late party in the bar, and I was finishing up a long day's shift. I had made an etouffee for the party that night, and had to clean a big ass old pot. I had already finished everything else clean-up wise, so all I had left was to dry and hang said big ass old pot. The bar line had an overhead pot hangy thingy, with giant hooks to hold the pots by the handles. These hooks were four to five inches deep, and could have been used to hang beef. I dried the pot, and slipped it on the hook and made my way around the corner to the break room to clock out and grab my shit. I am the only one left in the kitchen, so I would go through and start to turn off all the lights, and made my way back to the delivery door. As I laid my hand on the doorknob, a tremendous clangor shot through the whole kitchen. It sounded like a cannonball had gone off, and made me jump about 3.5 feet off the ground. My heart is racing, and my mind is going a mile a minute. I immediately turn all the lights back on, and give up the old, Is anyone there? No one was. I grabbed the biggest butcher knife we had, affectionately named Old Choppy, 
and started to slowly ninja my way through the gallery, seeking out whatever the hell made that sound. After a brief but thorough search, I determined that it must have come from the bar line. Great. Nothing like a blind corner and creepy ass activity to make a man feel special. I slowly, and I mean slowly, made my way around the corner, with the ever faithful Choppy guiding the way. Lo and behold, the part I had hung up was laying prostrate on the ground. I looked up at the hook, and all is well. How the hell did that thing jump off a five inch hook? I was really, really disturbed by this. I picked up the pot and hung it on the hook on the opposite side of the pot hanger and quickly made my way out of there. And here's the kicker. As I locked the door from the outside, boom. The sound of a pot hitting the ground, but muffled through the locked door, rings across the dark and empty parking lot. Like any smart man, I immediately noped out of there and went home. It wasn't until I got to bed that I realised that I had the breakfast shift the next day. The next morning, I got in at around 6 and the kitchen had been opened by the kitchen manager, who was putting around getting ready for the banquet later that day. I asked her if anyone had been on the back of the bar line that morning and she said no so I decided to go check it out quickly, and then got on with my day. I rounded the corner, and the pot was still on the hook. This was deeply disturbing to me, and I made every effort from that moment to never be on the bar line alone again. The second incident was enough to make me quit. We had a crazy day of prep ahead of us, as we had multiple functions that weekend including our famous Sunday brunch in the Colorado room. The head chef asked me to come in super early that Sunday so that we could be ready for the two parties and the brunch. I arrived around 4.30 in the morning, with reinforcements scheduled at 5.30, so I immediately went into arsehole and elbows mode as I had a mountain of shit to get done. I was working on the main line which faces the Colorado room's main serving doors. However, the line itself faces back into the kitchen galley. So, that puts your back to the dining room whilst working the line. I am deep into work mode when weird sounds start to penetrate my veil of concentration. It sort of sounds like kids playing in the dining room. <laughs> my subconscious mind immediately discounts this as not my problem, and I don't even break my stride on the line. After a few moments, a niggling thought is itching my brain that just doesn't go away. I distinctly remember a feeling of wrongness slowly descend upon me, and then it hit me. What the hell are kids doing, playing in the Colorado room at 4.30 in the morning? I immediately had that cold, icy feeling shoot up my spine, and then just out of the corner of my vision... I see the door to the Colorado room swing open just a bit, and I begin to hear the unmistakable sound of a rubber ball bouncing into the kitchen. As I swing my gaze quickly to the left, I see a red rubber kickball, clear as day, rebound in the gallery, with the far off sound of a child's laughter floating through the Colorado room. <laughs> I just froze. I have never been that freaked out in my entire life. My breath came in ragged gasps, and I stood there rooted to the spot. I must have stood stock still for a full minute, and then I heard the rear doors open and the sound of familiar voices. My reinforcements were there. I have never been more relieved to hear other people's voices than in that moment. The girl who was helping me that morning makes her way to the main line. She immediately stops in her tracks when she sees me, and I shit you not, she says, you look like you've seen a ghost. I quickly retell the tale to her and the prep boy, as we search the galley for the room, to no avail, and then turn the lights in the Colorado room to full blazing ass daylight, 
and go figure, no ghost children. I put my two weeks notice in the following day. The manager of the hotel asked me to sit down with him a few days later, after I inquired about a reference. He had heard my tale, and wanted to chat to me about it, and boy did he have a tale to tell. I thought that I had heard all of the tales associated with the alleged hauntings of the Hotel Colorado, but, apparently, she still keeps some secrets. It turns out that not long after the hotel opened, a little girl accidentally chased her rubber ball off a fifth floor balcony and fell to her death. She is frequently seen on the fifth floor in Victorian dress, and has even reportedly played catch with some of the guest's children. Her red ball was famous amongst workers of the hotel in previous generations, and its ghostly appearance frequented the banquet rooms, and yes, the kitchens too. Number 6. I am definitely a people person, so it didn't take me long to work my way up the ladder at our hotel. I loved that hotel. It was really old, built in 1967, and despite the shambles it was in when I worked there, it used to be the most happening place in town. The decor was unlike a lot of hotels you see today. Elaborate chandeliers with imported Spanish tiles and beautiful handmade stained glass skylights. A lot of people were shocked that our rooms were only 50 bucks a night, but it wasn't before long I realised that something was just off about that place. We had this service hallway that connected our kitchen and storage rooms to all of our conference rooms. It was my first day, and I'm taking a tour of the facilities with my manager whilst he's showing me around. I noticed how it smelt like a nursing home, like mothballs and death. And it was just unnaturally cold, especially for Louisiana in the spring. The deeper we go down the hallway, I started to actually feel sick. I put it off as my nerves, but whatever is in that kitchen slash hallway scared the shit out of me a couple of weeks later. I was working the 3 to 11 p.m. shift. Around 8 or 9 p.m., I went to find a guest some silverware from the kitchen. I was still pretty new there, so after searching for the light switch, I gave up and used my phone as a flashlight to grab the silverware. That's when I notice the sound of footsteps. Really fast footsteps. I start to turn around, and someone or something ran right past me in the dark, knocking over the stack of chafing dishes on the prep table. Needless to say, I said hell to the silverware and ran straight out of there. I ended up calling a housekeeper, who stayed in the hotel occasionally to grab it out of the kitchen, but she said no one was in there. No one working there wanted to go into that hallway. Even the cook would bring her granddaughter with her in the morning to keep her company while she got breakfast started. No one ever knew exactly what was back there. But I guess, then again, we just didn't want to find out. After that experience, I was sufficiently scared, but curious. I had become friends with our elderly breakfast cook, a little old woman probably in her 70s, Mrs. J. She mentioned to me that she'd been working there since the early 70s. She began telling me stories that made me never look at the hotel in the same way again. From what she told me, the owner was a cheap bastard, even when I worked there, and he didn't want to purchase actual security cameras for the entire property. So, he installed two actual cameras in the lobby, one at each entrance, and one by the pool, but placed mock cameras down the halls, giving the appearance of security, when actually they were just plastic boxes. Anyway, one night a young lady checked in, 
stinking drunk all by herself at one in the morning. She requested a smoking room, which are only located on the back of the property on the second floor. This area also has one of the many blind spots from our cameras. She goes to her room, and no one hears from her from the rest of the night. Not unusual, it's a hotel. That is until the housekeepers show up in the morning to find the woman in the parking lot, covered in blood, whiskey, and bloated. Apparently, after she checked in, she continued her binge on the balcony, facing the parking lot. She must have fallen off and bled to death there. The horrifying part is that she must have still been alive after the fall because of the trail of blood behind her. Like she was trying to crawl for help. And because there were no cameras, the front desk was blissfully unaware. We always had problems in that wing of the hotel afterwards. Domestic violence cases always came out of that wing. People's tempers just seemed to skyrocket when they stayed over there. Another interesting story she told me, and I ended up experiencing. There was a country singer named Charlie Rich, who died in one of our suites. Our suites were located inside the actual lobby, facing the front desk. He had a pulmonary embolism, whilst his wife was eating breakfast in our restaurant. Mrs. J was even there when his wife found him dead. Room 208. Ever since... A lot of customers have complained of people knocking on their door at odd hours, but the front desk never saw anyone go into the room. One customer came running out in the middle of the night. He ran up to the night auditor and told him that there was a man in his room. Of course, when the night auditor went to investigate, there was no sign of an intruder. A lot of the time, when the room would stay vacant for a while, the TV would turn on by itself. I even saw through the open window. It just turned on. And always the same channel. CMT Channel 71. Charlie never really bothered the staff. I even found myself talking to Charlie on our more quiet nights. Sometimes, I even played my old country playlist for him. I ended up quitting after working there for five years. The owner was doing some sketchy things with my paycheck, so I said my final farewell to the hotel that I had grown to love so much. Not even a year after I left, the owner suddenly shut down the hotel. Not sure why, but all the employees were told not to come back the next day, or ever. They left everything in there, all the papers, computers, furnitures, food, all left inside the massively vacant blood red building. Number 7. I worked overnight security in one of the largest, best and oldest hospitals in the US. My fellow security officers and I all have stories about one building in particular. But the one that I'll tell is the one that happened to me. Backstory for the building. It was built in the late 1800s and it was originally the psychiatric building for the hospital. Now being the late 1800s, not much was truly known about psychiatric disorders. And on top of that, this hospital was known for its medical research. With both those facts combined, you can infer that some terrible shit was done to these misunderstood psych patients in the building. A couple years before I started working security there, this building had been converted into offices after the newly built part of the hospital, dedicated a section for an updated psych ward. So, my rounds for the night happened to include said building. At night, this building was empty, due to recently being converted into offices, and the drones who worked there, wanting to leave promptly at five, if not earlier. In some of their haste, they had left the office doors unlocked, which is a big no-no due to medical information being located in their offices. It was our duty to go to each and every floor and make sure every door was locked, and if it wasn't, to secure it ourselves. I did my initial sweep of the building to make sure it was clear, 
and proceeded to do my door-to-door -door checks. The hallways were pretty narrow, so I could check both sides of the hallway doors at once. At the end of this hall, there were two sets of doors you had to go through to reach the final office, which was a dead end. Everything was secure, awesome, time for the next floor. I exited the two sets of doors from the dead end office, and stood absolutely frozen from what I saw. Every door ajar, set perfectly so their own weight wouldn't cause them to shut again, and one wheelchair at the end of the hallway, facing towards the steps. I had heard other security officers outright reject that set of rounds due to the strange stuff happening there, but I laughed it off until that night, and I never took those rounds again. Number 8 I was working in the third largest building on the planet for floor space. It's about 3am on a Sunday, and I'm walking down an aisle in the middle of my department. At this time, the place was nearly vacant as it was a holiday weekend, and we only had myself and a crew of maintenance workers under my direction, working in another department, all of whom were males. As I'm walking by my office on the plant floor, the power goes out, and the plant drops into the most absolute darkness that I have ever experienced. Power gone, I hear the various machines spinning down to rest, and the silence becomes overwhelming relative to the background noise that I had gotten used to. The faint sounds of running water become evident in the moments after the blackout, while I began searching my pockets for my phone and the flashlight that it offered. As my hand found my phone, a scream erupted from somewhere nearby, muffled and distant. It was the kind of scream you hear from a five-year-old girl in her first haunted house, as the bloody clown steps around the corner and fires up the chainsaw. It startled me so badly. I immediately dropped my phone into an alternate dimension. The scream continued, a constantly fading note that seemed to be moving away from my position. Panicked and terrified, I fumbled around the dirty floor for my phone and found it seconds before the emergency lights lit up the plant with an eerie glow of yellow light. Sweat beaded on my forehead as I looked about me, muscles tense and ready to defend against whatever this was. I tried my radio a couple of times before I realised that, with the power outage, the digital frequencies were useless without the receiver up in the main offices. I started to move through the various production lines, towards where I assumed the scream had originated. Mind working furiously, I had no women in my crew tonight, and we were the only people allowed in the plant. So where had the scream come from? Details began to press in my mind that I hadn't noticed before. The apparent youth of the voice behind the scream made no sense. It was a scream of pain, the kind you cannot even attempt to control. It had faded away from my position gradually, and then trailed off as if she had run out of breath. As I stepped between two products on one of the final assembly lines before a wide open space in the next apartment, the emergency lights dimmed, that audible electrical buzz filling the space around me. Struggling to understand what was happening, my senses were again knocked askew when the normal plant lights blazed to life, leaving spots across my vision for a moment, forcing me to raise my hand and shield my eyes. As the shadow crossed my vision, I saw it, or rather I saw her. Only for that moment, she stood there, hands outstretched towards me, a vague outline partially hidden behind one of our products. Dark features were the only distinguishable characteristic I can remember, as my reflex in that moment had been to blink against the bright lights, and she was gone after that. To this day, 
I have no idea if what I saw was real or if I had imagined it. No tales are told of the mysterious young woman in the repair hole, not by anyone but myself. No one knows of any deaths matching to her description in the area, or ghosts known to haunt the plant. Not a soul had heard a scream in the darkness, not before, during, or after those black pre-dawn minutes. Believe me, I tried to find someone, anyone with information that might explain what I saw, to no avail. I am left wondering, with a memory more crisp than any photo I've seen, of that young woman standing there in the distance, her arm outstretched towards me. Needless to say, I did not revisit the location of said event, ever, because nopes don't get any bigger than that. Number 9. I worked at a hospital, doing transport for a couple of years. The transport home base was in the basement of the hospital, where all the laundry is done, and supplies are also stored there. I hated working late nights after this incident. On this particular night, I was the only one in the basement, when I heard whistling at the end of the hallway by the elevator. I poked my head around the corner, expecting to see my only co-worker on duty that night. But there was absolutely no one there. I shrugged it off. I'm not easily spooked. Nights are slow. So I ate some snacks and hung out in the break room for a bit. Next thing I know, I hear a loud bang. I walk into the hallway and a bed is rolling down the halls bumping into the sides. At this point, I think my co-worker is bullshitting me, so I radio him, and he says he's upstairs in the cafeteria. Ah, I still don't believe him, and think I'll catch him in the act. I walk past the laundry room, and the machines start. I pop my head in, expecting to find him there, but it's completely empty. Okay, Starting to get a little nervous, I walked into the laundry room, and the machines completely stopped. I freeze, then run out and head towards the elevator, and I hear the whistling again. At this point, I know I am the only worker in the basement. As I am standing there waiting for the elevator, things start falling off the shelf down the hall. Boxes of gloves, tissues, packages of tubes. I am literally standing there, watching them fall off one by one at the opposite end of the hallway. I shit you not, my entire body broke out in goosebumps. My hair stood on the end, and I had a strong gut feeling I was being watched. I was not alone. As I was getting into the elevator, I feel what felt like someone brushing my arm. I went upstairs and found my co-worker in the cafeteria and freaked out to him. I got out of there and transferred soon after that. The creepy thing to add is that I usually whistle mindlessly to myself at work. It's almost as if the spirit was mimicking me. Creepiest feeling ever. Number 10. At the end of last year, I had to move back in with my mum due to the breakdown of my marriage. My mum lives in a house which was built in the late 1900s, and a lot of surrounding houses have been rebuilt over the years due to bomb damage in World War II. It was probably the hardest time of my life, as I was adjusting to being newly single, a recovering alcoholic, and a single mum, and keeping my full-time job as a funeral director. Strangely enough, I could comfortably stay late at my work, on my own, in the cold room, presenting people in their coffins on my own. However, I would dread going home to my mum's house. The atmosphere was just... off. 
my mum had often spoken of her house being haunted by a lady who she called Mary and had claimed that she woke up one Christmas Eve with the lady, in a 40-style tea room dress, standing in her room, looking out of her window. We had been there that night, when my ex-husband and I were still together, and filmed our little boy wandering around upstairs, with inexplicable lights following him around. The stairs led to two rooms, the one on the left, which was my mother's, and the one on the right, which was the spare bedroom. The bathroom was downstairs, attached to the kitchen. My mother has always been a bit of a drama queen, so we brushed it off. However, once I moved in with her, she went to work. She worked night shifts as a nurse, leaving me alone in the house. And that's when I started to notice things. I would wake up at 3am, with my bedroom door slamming open hear people walking around downstairs, and the cupboard under the stairs would open its doors randomly, and I could hear my son's toys going off. Despite spending 90% of my time around dead people, I felt petrified. The atmosphere was all wrong, so I did what any 25-year-old would do, and hid under my duvet until my mum got home at 7am. A couple of weeks later, I was sitting on my bed chatting up people on Tinder, when something hit me, and fell onto the bare floorboards by my bed. It was one of my knitting needles, which had been embedded in a ball of wool across the room. I haven't really got a rational explanation as to how it could have got there. In January, I took an overdose in the spare room. I had lost my job that day, and it was the straw that broke the camel's back. I took 360 Tamadrol, with some other meds and a litre of vodka. Obviously, I ended up surviving, but had done quite some damage to my body. I sat in the lounge trying to read a book, when I saw someone prep around the doorframe from a height. The stairs are right behind the doorframe, so it was as though someone was stood on the stairs peering round. My mum was sleeping off her shift at the time, and her bed is noisy, so I knew it wasn't her, and this person, or Mary, was unnaturally white. I moved out into my own flat in April, and really couldn't wait to see the back of my mum's house. Just too many horrible memories, and the overwhelming feeling that I wasn't wanted there. My nana had bought me some pots and pans so that I could cook at mine, and she'd left them in my mum's dining room on the table. I picked them up on my way through town, and discovered that my mum had moved in the grandfather clock which her grandfather had made, as my nana gave it to her, with the promise that she'd fix the mechanism, which made a bong sound every 15 minutes. As I picked up my pans, the clock bonged really loudly, and I scuttled out. I told mum later that the clock looked great, although it was a bit creepy in her house with all the noise it made. That's when she told me it didn't have the weights or pendulum, so it would have been impossible to make a noise. My nana and uncle have both stayed at my mum's house and have had very similar experiences. I try to stay away because although I don't think there's anything harmful there, it makes me feel unsettled staying there for any length of time. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I had a lot of fun making this video, I really loved reading these stories, all so spooky in their own right. I hope that you felt the same way. Also, merchandise is now available for purchase, so if you'd like to see my wares, look no further than the description. If you enjoyed today's video, please consider dropping a like and leaving a comment. It's a really great way to help support the channel, and I really appreciate it. And if you would like to do something truly incredible to help support the channel even further, feel free to visit my Patreon page. You can find the link to that in the description, as well as the links to my social media. And if you'd like your story read on my channel, 
you can submit it as a text post to my Reddit or send it to me via email. Both links can be found in the description. But anyway, for now guys I'm going to sign off and chill with the ghosts. Stay awesome and I'll see you in the next one.